vaccines are stealing the headlines and the financing. That's the main complaint of scientists in search of a COVID therapy. Treatments are still elusive, despite hundreds of drugs being developed or repurposed. But thousands of people are dying from the disease every day. Preventing it from killing people is vital, but doing so can take many forms. Researchers are working tirelessly to find an effective treatment to prevent severe symptoms from the illness or death. A leading expert on COVID therapeutics, Rolf Hermke, told DW we could see a breakthrough soon with so many medicines in various stages of development. Some of them are already tried, tested with patients. Others are in a laboratory stage. And we see some good interim results which lead us to, to think that we can see improvements within the next half year. And he says the virus could well stick around after the pandemic. So there may always be people who need treatment. Here's a look at some of the most promising therapies being worked on. You may know the name hydroxychloroquine. It was often uttered by former U.S. President Donald really Trump, who had reporting. hoped it could help win you the fight against COVID-19. Let's see if it works. It might and it might not. I happen to feel good about it, but who knows? But science disagreed with that feeling. After studies showed that the decades-old anti-malarial drug was ineffective against the new virus, U.S. authorities revoked its emergency use authorization. Now, a year into the pandemic, researchers are getting a clearer picture of what works and what doesn't. Back to Trump, and this time a success story. When the president himself ended up in the hospital with COVID-19, he was given a drug cocktail made by the company Regeneron. Trump quickly recovered and became a walking advertisement for the treatment. The RegenCoV-2 treatment uses artificial antibodies that bind to virus cells and prevent them from replicating. So far, studies have shown promising results. Now the German government has ordered 200,000 doses of antibody treatments from Regeneron and competitor Eli Lilly at a price of around $2,000 per dose. Another promising prospect, interferon beta. It's a protein produced by the body when it gets an infection and early findings suggest that when it's inhaled by an infected person, it could keep 80% of hospitalized patients off the ventilator. And this rare sea animal off the coast of Spain has become an unlikely source of hope. A substance extracted from it is being used to create a drug called plitidepsin, or aplidin, which can slow the spread of the coronavirus in the human body. Early studies show it to be 30 times more effective than the once hyped remdesivir. One problem, all of these treatments are expensive and will likely only be available in the world's wealthier countries. Demand for widely available drugs like ivermectin has surged in Latin America and sub-Saharan Africa. Ivermectin is an inexpensive anti-parasite drug, but scientists warn its effectiveness is still in doubt. Some doctors in developing nations are instead putting their hopes in affordable steroid treatments like dexamethasone. But for the World Health Organization, the focus is still clear. Vaccinate enough of the world's population over the next year to put the pandemic behind us. For more on COVID-19 vaccines versus treatments, here's our science correspondent Derek Williams with another of our viewer questions. Why are we looking at vaccines as the only solution? Most of the few medications being used to try to treat COVID-19, like those we just saw, are what are known as repurposed medicines. That means they were originally planned for, for something else. Remdesivir, for example, was originally developed as a possible therapy for Ebola. Uh, when the pandemic hit, researchers started testing these existing medications first uh, because they'd already fulfilled a, a crucial criterion. Um, they'd proven safe to take. Around 400 drugs for treating COVID-19 are, are currently in human trials, uh, many of them also repurposed. Uh, they can be split into three broad categories. Uh, first, are medications like monoclonal antibodies, which are aimed 
at keeping moderate cases of COVID-19 from getting worse. Um, if they're given to patients at the right time by blocking the virus, they can sometimes stop the body's immune system from going into this dangerous tailspin that can ravage the lungs and, and the heart and, and other organs. If that happens anyway, um, doctors start employing the second type of drugs, which are anti-inflammatories, um, like dexamethasone. They calm down that hyperimmune response that can cause more damage than the infection itself. Um, the third group of medications, which are at the top of doctors' wish lists, are antiviral drugs. Uh, they attack viruses directly in a variety of ways, rather than just trying to block them or, or treat their consequences. Uh, but for a number of biological reasons, including the facts that they replicate in our own cells and that they change constantly, um, viruses present a difficult target for drug developers. Uh, developing new antivirals is, is a long, painstaking and, and expensive process. So to answer your question, um, many of us are still looking at vaccines as the only solution because we still simply don't have the kinds of tailored knockout therapies that we need to keep people from dying. Um, but, but that'll hopefully change soon. Scott Bergman is pharmacy coordinator of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at Nebraska Medicine. Uh, let's start with repurposed drugs because there was a lot of hope placed in those. A year on, doctors still only have a handful of options, none of which have proven convincing. Why is that? That's right, Ben. COVID-19 is still very difficult to treat, and that's because coronaviruses are more complex than other viruses. Their genomes are larger than most RNA viruses, and they have a way of double-checking viral replication. There have been a lot of mixed results with these repurposed drugs, and I think that's because disease presentation matters so much. At what stage they're at when they come in really impacts what therapies we would try to use. Balancing that immunosuppression and that fighting inflammation you know, we really have to be cautious about that so the virus doesn't increase replication if we start it too early. Is that the same reason for antivirals, why it's so difficult to tailor uh, those treatments to this disease? With antivirals, we really want to start those earlier, and most patients don't come in to seek care, at least in the hospital, until seven or ten days of illness. Now, with testing being more available, we are seeing them earlier, uh, we just don't have good drugs yet that work on the virus. The antibodies are really our, our best option when we can identify it early. Why is it, though, when, when vaccines were here in just 10 months? Yeah, the development process for antivirals is very difficult. It often takes 10 years for really any drug to be developed, and we're trying to do that in 10 months. With vaccines, there were multiple platforms that could be used to uh, insert the target for COVID-19 to develop antibodies. But with drug development, you really need to have a, a target for that, that treatment or for that virus you know, when they come in. And it's much more difficult and complex to coordinate these clinical trials in, in human volunteers, where with vaccines, there was thousands of people lining up to try to be protected. And COVID-19 was so prevalent in the community, it was easier to measure that response, the antibodies and the protection from it. And uh, we just don't have the, the antivirals sitting around that were super effective. Remdesivir was mentioned, has a little bit of activity. But we even with other viruses, we don't have a lot of good antivirals, like influenza, for example, there's only a few drugs you know, that work on it. We have to target it in the cells of the body, and it's more difficult to de develop drugs for that than it is for, say, antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics you can grow in a lab on their own and get a relatively good check of whether it's going to work in a patient. But viruses have to be developed in, in cells, in the, the lab, even in animal models, it doesn't always predict whether it'll work in a human because of the differences in cell type. 
Now, disease prevention, of course, is one of the main goals, but that doesn't help someone who contracts the virus today. How, how much longer will patients have to wait, do you think? One, one expert we heard from earlier reckons within the next half year. Yeah, I could say it may be within six months, but I'd say more likely it'll be years that we're going to wait for a very effective treatment. I think you know a lot of our resources were put into vaccine development to try to prevent it. Uh, the next phase should be in in drug development, but as I said, it's very difficult to to target that mechanism of replication for viruses and especially coronavirus. What is the main focus when it comes to producing medicines against COVID? There are a, a couple different strategies. Uh, one of them is to to deliver the drugs earlier at the site of infection. Um, Remdesivir, for example, has an inhaled formulation that is being studied. Um, there's another oral antiviral, Malnupivir, that is being studied. That's an oral option that could be given earlier in the community uh, in an attempt to terminate these, this viral replication pattern inside the body in, in a different way so that that proofreading enzyme within COVID-19 doesn't recognize that there's a change and that the RNA then falls apart while it's trying to replicate. Scott Bergman from Nebraska Medicine, thank you very much for being on the show today. A pleasure. Thank you.